John Monaghan, principal, Sunderland High School. Megan Reed, assistant principal, Sunderland High School. Jody Gardner, principal, Sunderland Central Elementary School. Harry Chair, director of student services. Thank you, Karen. We've got a great family. Okay, we could uh, find the flag. Next on our agenda will be school board meeting minutes for December 6th. Months. 
and you know, an average of 2.5 <coughs> emails, a little more than that per month. The 73 emails, got zero responses, ever. You guys serve everyone, not just people who can agree with. If zero, Jesse, we're the winner of 11%. Uh, April, we started the one email ever. I wonder if any viewpoint discrimination reflected in these response rates. And if anyone wanted to do a forensic survey of your email system, you might find that you're responding to people with a certain viewpoint at a different rate than you're responding to people's viewpoints you might share. For many, myself included, public forum has become the only vehicle for communicating with the school board. I urge the board to scrap this token CD policy. Please, everyone, grant the families you are elected to serve in your three minutes of your time. Once you know. Thank you, Rick. I'm not done. You have three minutes. If that is too much of three minutes, then you've a lot of If that is too much of an imposition on any of you, you should all resign. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also on the agenda is, uh, you know, whatever you're planning on doing, building <coughs> buildings. I just want to point out that the design, I believe, the capacity of this building is for 350 students. And the, since the remodeling at the high school, the capacity over there is 450 students. And currently, some of the, in total, has less than 400 students that originate from the sun. You have some teachers' kids that are brought in, and there's a few tuition kids, but in total, we have less than 400 kids that we're responsible for. And it seems like within these two buildings, we should be able to work it out with the capacity of 800 kids. That has to be Also, Um, 
On January 5th, I sent an email out to all the school board, and I want to thank Russ for his uh, correspondence and Paul for a telephone conversation. Uh, but I'd like to confirm that Ed, did you get the email? And Brian? Yes. And April? April's, April's not here. Jesse? Thank you. Uh, taxpayers have little opportunity to comment um, mm -hmm. or have dialogue. And if, the, if this policy, BEDH, passes, uh, we'll only have five or six opportunities a year. And that means less than 14 minutes uh, per person per year to make comments. Uh, your policy says that uh, public <coughs> comment is vital, yet I don't see, uh, I, I, don't, I don't get that response. No one responds, uh, responds to my emails. Um, I've had zero response from Brian I've had, and April. I've had one thank you from Ed, thank you. And uh, I met, fortunately, I had a wonderful conversation face to face with Jesse and thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you, Jesse. And we've had a few emails back and forth. And I've had uh, phone conversations with Paul. Thank you for, for all of that. Uh, your strategic plan uh, lists improving communication. And I just want to say, is this how it's done with the EH? My fear is that the school board is limiting public comment because um, they're not prepared or informed on issues being discussed. I believe that you are using legal protection as an excuse not to engage. I'd like um, examples of what you think has been inappropriate public comment in the past. And I believe that we've all been uh, polite and respectful. Um, I do not want to, um, to hear, if you don't want to hear from constituents, constituents uh, there's no reason to limit free speech. I also please understand that the New Hampshire School Board Association does not make law. They only suggest policy, and the New Hampshire School Board Association does not encourage quality education or advocate for children. Please research what the New Hampshire School Board Association does and see how they're spending your money and what they are championing. The SAU lawyers are here to protect board members. They do not care about best practices, uh, quality communication, or educational advancement opportunities. If the board members do not want to hear from the taxpayers or say they don't have time, uh, please step down and allow people, uh, qualified citizens who are sincerely interested and want to advocate for students and quality, edu and quality education to sit on the board. Um, if any of you are uncomfortable with my comments, please know that this is all free speech. And my intent and my sincere attempt my, uh, is not uh, to intent is not to embarrass anyone. And if I have, let's talk about it. Um, uh, I feel that my comments come from the elephant in the room. Uh, I hope that going forward, we'll all be willing to work together towards open discussion, full transparency, with only our only goals being to improve and advance opportunities for our students. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Jim. Hi, my name is Sean Shisco, 16th Bradford Road, actually the former home of that lady who painted that mural, as a matter of fact, I just haven't noticed that. Um, as you know, I've never been to one of these meetings except for once, and there's a reason I'm here, and not because the fact that you guys are proposing said policy to me is complete rubbish. I can't believe we're wasting our time doing this. First Amendment is ultimately the most important thing, that's why it's the First Amendment, that's what we started with. From my understanding, the main reason that this policy wants to be instituted is this fear of retribution in the form of a suit from a teacher whose name may be mentioned in a public forum. If that's the case, unfortunately, you guys are 100% wrong. There's multiple, multiple precedents set already that say specifically, let me reference a few for you, for example. In Boca versus Morono Valley Unified School Districts, District of California, 1996, a federal district court in California ordered a school board not to enforce a regulation against charges or complaints against any employee of the district, which would include teachers, correct? The plaintiff, who was silenced and ultimately moved from the room by sheriff's deputies when addressing the board about what grievances against the principal and superintendent went unaddressed, argued that the rule violated the free speech. The judge agreed in the ruling. So that was probably a suit that we paid for. We just discussed a budget of $25,000. So if part of this is the main impetus to it, 
to prevent us from spending additional money, I argue that why are we creating a potential situation to spend more money that's not going to probably be in your favor or ours as taxpayers? So, that being said, even to go further, technically, if you read the policy we currently have right now, it almost is not complicit because it says that in your policy effectively that if you don't like what somebody's saying, you can stop them. But I would like to let you know that there's also another precedent that's been set, also coincidentally in California, uh, Leventhal versus Vista Unified School District 1997, where it said, another California district court struck down a school district bylaw prohibiting, quote, improper conduct or remarks by public presenters. The district defined improper remarks to mean complaints against an individual employee, a speaker who twice was silenced while trying to raise questions about the qualifications of the district school superintendent, sued the invalidated bylaw, and a judge found the restrictions unconstitutional. So, as a taxpayer, please stop. It's stupid. This is the dumbest thing I've heard in my life. I can't believe we're actually going this route. We have so many other issues. Just the budget alone is a pain in the butt. And by the way, this is coming from a person who's been where you guys are, not on the school board, but I was the youngest elected official that kind of hooks it on the hooks of budget committee. I've negotiated teachers union contract, I've negotiated with the SAU withdrawal committee, I've put the time in. If the biggest impetus to it is because you don't want to spend additional time listening to the public, nobody's making up there. There's not a single person that's forced to be up there right now, is there? Does anybody have a gun to their head that we don't know about? Because if they do, I feel bad for them. But that's not the case. There's plenty of people who are run. In fact, I think we all know a few situations of prevention of people from running, right? So it's not like your seats can't be taken. So if that's the impetus to it, then let's not do that. Plain and simple. And I want to let you know that I planned on moving out of Sunnyview once my son graduates high school. If this does grow, goes, go through, my whole entire life plan will be to get on the school board and get this policy reversed. Thank you. The most recent addition 
is this elevated lobby area, uh, which became a, a big uh, stride forward in having ADA accessibility. That was then in 86. Uh, the building sits on a 7.1 acre site. Uh, the department of bed uh, requires you to have five minimum, but it's buildable. You basically have half of that because of the slopes. And that includes like five properties, including uh, the Sherburn and Gymnasium. Uh, the areas of deficiencies in here are, are really the building's uh, shell is very old and basically very little to no insulation. So if you look at energy code, it, it really falls short. Your grandfather will let you do something. So if you start renovating, the, uh, the uh, energy code would come into effect. It's a state mandated code. The other issues that, that really occur in the building, uh, maybe a larger footnotes, is the uh, fire alarm system is pretty much outdated and needs to be replaced. There are other things like your communication system is part of your telephone. It's really got a separate uh, <coughs> system that should, really should be in the sense of security and, uh, and the like. Uh, ADA wise, we've done pretty well because the elevator connects all the different levels. And on two levels there's a ramp. The only place that's sufficient for ADA accessibility is the stage. The bathrooms have been updated over time. There are some areas that need to be upgraded at another level, but it looks like uh, working uh, with the director, Matt, and the majority principal, we've got a lot of this going every single summer. So we keep seeing you're picking away at the building. Uh, the roof itself is over 20 years old. They have a scan, and they're going to be repairing about 10 percent of that. But that's getting to the point where a warranty of 20 years, you can get 25, but you've got to stop looking at maybe that one needs to be replaced. It's an older vintage. The R values for the insulation is probably R19. Today's at like 34, 36. Things of that nature. A lot of the areas too, like in the classrooms, many of the classrooms have uh, storage. They've been taken up for other educational spaces. Um, the stairs, uh, the center one right out here, is a real issue in the sense of today's code. Because it's buried, it doesn't have an egress path directly outdoors that is rated. So that is not performance. Uh, and that's a, probably a big issue with, uh, with egress from life safety code. You have another stay here that on the bottom level, this is again the level we're on now, uh, what we call the basement level, has some intrusions into the stair, directly to the stairwell, which has basically has exposed timbers underneath the stair, which has a fire code issue. The other ones are the cafeteria. It's really been reduced in size because it's a, it's a, a, a circulation area. But what happens is if you're in the cap, you have to go through the adjoining space, uh, which is illegal. You're supposed to go directly to egress and directly to a, an exterior uh, exit. Um, the, the boiler's in pretty good shape, but it's at capacity. The electrical uh, services are at capacity. All the panel boards are pretty much maxed out. Again, as I said, the fire alarm really needs to be upgraded. Uh, it shows it has six zones, but there's only seven zones on the enunciated panel. That's another thing with the fire alarm system. That, it's really lacking, so that needs to be caught up. Uh, the kitchen doesn't have an exhaust hood over the stove. Um, it, it, it's really extremely tiny. There, there are some general minor technical issues that are in the report that need to be brought up to code. Uh, the staff area on the first floor coming in um, has a, a stove, it doesn't have a problem with that. There's, there's a lot of things. Uh, once you touch the building, you have to bring all these up to code. Uh, I'm not, not going to go much further this simply because I know that there's, there's uh, pressing time for other things. The third floor, similar, uh, is accessible the elevator ramp. Uh, the stairs is also, this is the only stair going down on the upper floor. The actual second of meters is through this corridor down the stair, which is not legal. So this end is in pretty tough shape in the sense of uh, life safety code. Uh, one of the uh, uh, bright notes is places have been well maintained. Uh, given the total majority of that, and uh, it's amazing. All the engineers were pretty happy to see you're picking away things, you're constantly doing things, so you are operating the facility. The Sherman Auditorium uh, 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 Gym is a, a wonderful place. It really gives an enhancement to the facility since it takes care of your PE. It, it's, it, it's extremely well, well built. It's not that old. 
on the downside, we get some uh, temporary modules which have an addition on them, some art music, and an addition was added to the module, which is a little bit not what you're supposed to be doing. Modules are supposed to be temporary, but uh, due to the, the, the needs of some of the spaces we can get in the educational assessment, again, in addition to a, to a temporary classroom. So, and it's a tough situation because it's, it's disconnected to the school, and there's a lot of uh, Items that are more subjective. It, winter time is tough to get at. Teachers have to go back and forth. Students, communication is a little tough. But that's a facility analysis. Um, what I really, want to keep saying is these are the facts. These are from codes. These are from requirements by the state statute, the building code requirements, the life safety codes. But these are not subjective to our interpretation of something that it is arbitrary, it is based on code. Uh, ABA is not a code, it's law, so that's a little, a little bit different. But same thing with that, uh, there's interpretations on the books, you can go on file and take a look at it. So th th that's a real quick nutshell on the facilities. Of course, I don't know if there's anything I should add, and I'm curious to it. Anything safety and uh, the biggest thing I, I personally feel is, a, is something that with schools, the code does require an egress and you're locking in the two stairs. They're really tough. Uh, that, that's one that when we see a building like this, it's kind of overlooked because it's there, it's worked all these years. But once we get involved with a building plan to renovate, we're going to get the state fire marshals going to review that and we'll require a waiver if we're trying to keep it. But they're going to be pretty stringent on that egress element. And the other one is a wooden one that's exposed to the knee, and it's a storage area or pump. Uh, that, that should not be entering into a stairway if something occurs, that stair goes up pretty quick. Um, so as a building shell, it's an old building shell, it would be nice if you did renovate the old part and to fur all the exterior walls, add some studs and get some insulation in there. Uh, as I say, the roof uh, is 20 years old, it's probably, as I say, uh, quite low in our value at the time. Probably just not. But as time goes on, um, these things uh, will, will come back and affect your your, your compliance to codes, electrical, mechanical, uh, structural. Because it's an old building, it's also grandfathered. But if we're adding some mechanical things on the roof or we're doing things, we're going to have to go back and look at uh, the codes. There's a part that is existing conditions. Your grandfather's a percentage of the code if you touch it. Right now, you're totally grandfathered. But in the report, it does tell you the steps necessary where the old buildings will typically uh, be challenged on uh, current sites and current loads. Jesse, you and I sit on the committee, so if you have any other Oh, I, I would just uh, thank you for the summary. For the community members who haven't digested the detailed report, what are the, just to restate the top uh, priorities from most recent you know, tour review. What you put so if you, if you sum it down, some key things you want the community to be thinking about, what are those three to five things? Well, you're going to need the, the current codes. As soon as you touch it, you, you, not, you have to abide by it. It's going to be life safety is a priority. Fire alarm systems is going to be a priority. The shell uh, is a priority for energy code, but it's also uh, a payback. You know, if you start fixing up the shell and you bring that up to the project, it's going to be fuel wise. Your electrical uh, service is maxed out and your roll is maxed out. So if you add five, 6,000 square feet, those two systems are going to have to be operated uh, all the way back to the floor and all the way to the uh, uh, electrical entrance. Those are some of the big ones. If you touch the door, you're going to get challenged. Thank you. Brian, Ed, anything you want to add? Thank you. Which is um, totally different. It goes by the Department of Ed guidelines and state statutes, RSA. And uh, because it, it's hard to really read the report and visualize, we came up with this method of providing efficiency plans. It really helps to see visually. The, the, the method we use on doing the educational assessment is um, we basically categorize all the rooms of what they are. Jody was a great host of walking us through the whole building, telling us what they used for, and we got into the DOE uh, 
binocular what the space is going to call it. And we match those uh, areas like classrooms based on Department of Ed determination, or science, whatever. Uh, so with that said, we started off uh, cataloging every single room, gave it its proper name for Department of Ed, gave the square footage, and we labeled it. There are areas like classrooms, general classrooms, specialized classrooms like art music, then the special ed, special services, and then there's the administration supports, which are educational, and then there's uh, facility support, such as janitor closet, and ballroom. So those are the categories we broke up in the report. Then we go into uh, breaking those into groups, like um, classrooms. Classrooms have a requirement. In New Hampshire, DOE requires a classroom to be 90 square feet. You have 13 classrooms. You get one that passes. A lot of them don't. They're close. But working with the Department of Ed, they usually will allow you to use 36 square foot per person. You tend to have really low classroom sizes because it's a small school district. And you've got a lot of uh, interlearning uh, with special ed classrooms. So that's, that, that, that's the part that the uh, school board and the, office, uh, the educators do. It's very normal in elementary that you don't max them out. Uh, that came out in the sense of matching up with the Department of Ed, about 261, even though you only have 160 kids. But you've got a lot of storage in these spaces. Uh, it, it's kind of a dual use in many of the spaces with special needs and so on and so forth. So that one, somebody had mentioned, you can have 400 students uh, approximately. But in the classroom part, you're fine. As soon as you start hitting all the other areas, like our room, you've got to across the street. You've got special ed. You've got places, nooks and crannies, just to give you an idea. Uh, this is the uh, basic level of the elevator. They actually have a teaching space with desks and chairs. Totally legal and COVID standpoint, but not very good for educational point of view. Under this stair, there's another area of couple of chairs in the teaching space. You also have it on the upper floor. You got a printer out here, which is part of the administration. And then you got a sorting out here. You've got a lot of these nooks and crannies that shows the, the uh, heartaches of your program. You, you, you're, you're just filling the space up with whatever you can to find nooks and crannies. This is the upper level. The reds, just to let you know, those are the classrooms. The dark reds are you know, basically not within the compliance of 90 square feet. Um, if you have one that's really close, I know you have one classroom that really needs it. Uh, the area is also where there's some educational deficiencies. Is like this occupational therapy it doesn't meet square foot requirements. Uh, it also gets interrupted uh, by having travel between the classroom, which is not great for education. The cafeteria, even though it's large, it's uh, almost like 400 square feet because of the circulation space. It's a little less than 900 square feet, and, it, and you've got at least three lunches in there. That's a tough area for educational. Um, the uh, areas here, blue, is the, the uh, Spaces that have special ed that's been taxed out. The stage is just totally capped out with a lot going on in there. The uh, media center has got a lot going on. You can see there's teaching spaces, there's a computer lab, as I say. There's a lot of things going on. It's a beautiful space, but it's used. It's heavily used. Uh, so with these plans, it's a lot easier than reading the report because so you'll get all the uh, nitty gritty. And uh, at the end of the report, we have the third place where we talk about the deficiencies and then we transfer those deficiencies on the plan. Just to make it a little bit more visual on where you have issues. So all the color areas have issues. So you've got about a good third, if not more, of the building that's got some educational issues that you need to attend to at some point in time. Especially if you're considering an addition renovation. These are the things you want to get on the educational level. As I say, these are not subjective. These are the only standards uh, that were written in the guideline in 2006. Uh, I was actually on the board uh, on that group. There was three four architects, some school board members, etc. We went through it and we spent a year and a half operating in the state statute of our RSAs, which are based on law, like the idea of having nine square feet. That, that is law, uh, like five usable acres of buildable land. That's there. The other one uh, that you've been working with is two means of egress on the site. Uh, we've tried uh, several times to get a second means of egress. Well, we were involved some 10 years ago. We actually got a waiver from Edward uh, That should be a record. I do not know how long that lasts, but right now you have basically a record waiver. But uh, it's 
also concerned with fire and safety and ambulances. The school street goes out, climbing up the hill. Emergency meetings down at the time. But you've done a wonderful job of so you've done a great educational uh, staff. Uh, everybody is working hard, all the spaces you can see it being uh, utilizing every square inch. I mean, uh, you ought to be proud of what you're turning out of your students. Uh, I think they're, they've got a great staff and a great attitude. But, uh, these are the facts. These are the, uh, as Paul said, this is the Joe Friday report. This is the facts. These two reports. And they stand alone. We separate it because if somebody gets an education, we can deal with that with facilities. We don't come together. A lot of architects and engineers will blend them together and it's very messy trying to figure out why is that, why is that. So we have broken up into two parts. Hoping that helps. Uh, with a guideline to stop looking at what you want to do. If you do, these are the two documents you need to uh, stop taking seriously. I'll take any kind of question. Just to restate so everyone leaves the shared understanding on the dark red being deficient fluctuation. So if we continue to ask students, what's that tipping point? What, what you do is, because you have in the average of 18, 20 students and you basically multiply 36, you can get away from the Department of Ed is actually, uh, we agree we're not going to keep more than X amount of students and if you do the math, we're in compliance. Typically, they will give that. As long as it's in the 850 zone, you start getting low 850, low, uh, they're going to get a little bit of a wash about, geez, we really don't want to give you a waiver, you should be better uh, equipped to carry more students because population increases with the median deal and standards. Um, special ed is the one that is crowded the building into corridors on the stairs, which is also um, a second note is it uh, is a facility code problem as well as an educational method of teaching out in the open being interrupted. It's difficult. Um, the other one is eventually you got to do some of those modules. Uh, I don't know how long it'll last. We really like to call them permanent. Yeah, they're very permanent with the addition. So it, it would be nice if you, whatever you do, you blend that into the facilities. Uh, technically, we took them out of the report and not put them in there because they're supposed to be temporary. So we do want to review them. Um, they are small square foot than what would be required. But the modules on leave them alone. Uh, Sherbert is in great shape. Sherbert, you have plenty of capacity for your PE. Great assembly space, a lot of things happen there that you can't do in this space because of what you uh, have had to do in this space. So, luckily, you have sure it ends up. I do have a facility. The biggest thing is the uh, challenge of going down the hill, especially the past couple of weeks here when we've had some heavy snow. That's got to be tough to maintain. I'm getting hats off to everybody in the community. It's, uh, it's a nice, nice place to visit. Brian, Ed, do you guys have anything you want to add any questions? Our population of students stays the same. What you see is uh, everything you're talking about, the most important thing that we should focus on. It, it's not really one. A lot of it on the educational is how are you teaching, how the staff feels about their areas, what needs improvement. That's really a, a kind of an in-house kind of shakedown. Uh, giving you the facts, we just got to do it internally, what's important. Um, at least the classrooms counts work very well. But I think the area that's really struggling with special needs, you're using nooks and crannies, and you're putting them in open spaces, that's got to be difficult for educators. Again, I'm not an educator, but I, I've done this a lot, and I know that's a, a sweet spot where you're trying to get students who need some special help, and you, you put them in a public area, and it's hard to keep their attention, their focus. So that, that, that's got to be tough. Um, so just to clarify, so one classroom meets the yeah, current one classroom that we can do nine square feet or square foot. Square foot. Right. One of them does. One, one out of thirteen. One out of thirteen. Twelve do not meet it. One of them does. I'm not saying that in the sense that it's extremely. Oh my God! A lot of schools this vintage constantly have the older buildings built in the twenties and thirties and forties where the standards weren't there for deal. So they are small. And we don't have the technology. We don't have the issues uh, of how the teaching styles are. They need that space. They store a lot of equipment, supplies. 
instructional information, that's their home base. And elementary is one of the toughest because when you get in middle high, uh, you, you start getting more into technology, but um, the little kids kind of like the touch and feel things, and the teachers also like to work with them in a touch and feel way is really you know, getting, getting them excited about education. So we, we see this very, very common. And by the way, we're working in the area, we're working in Hopkinton, we're working in Stoddard, so we work this area, working in uh, Dover, that, that's kind of my passion. I love K through 12. It's just a lot of fun just working and doing something creative. And at the end of the day, if something comes out of it, that, that's pleasing. That's a good thing. And just a reality, just last question. Um, just, just a reality check. Talking about for special needs, small area by the cafeteria and under hallways and things. How much space? Considering an old building, not saying high and sky, but considering the needs of the building, giving context to the other classrooms being undersized to current recommendations. How much space are we deficient for special needs? Special needs is actually not in the DOE guidelines. The old rule of thumb was 60 square feet per student. So if you have 10 students, you need 600 square feet, you have, have a special needs resource area. As compared to 36 square feet? Exactly, and that's what I was saying. <laughs> breaks down all these things in the five areas. So, but the special ed used to have a number, but because of all the different types of needs, they can't say it's 60, because it's subject to the needs of the students. Like OTPT, occupational therapy, physical therapy, need more room, because they got a lot of equipment. Whereas if you have a tutoring space, the 60 might be a little on the high side, because you may have a lot of one. Uh, that's something you have to search through as a district. It's an old rule, but it's no longer used as an emphatic DOE guideline you have to have. But you have to provide the spaces if you have needs. Did you bring a chart showing the overlay of our acreage and the building growth? In the report there is. I actually took the tax map and outlined I, I the areas. This is sort of a set of questions. There's five, five pieces of property that is labeled either school district or a town school district. The ball field is not. So there's five separate pieces, including Sherbert, kind of like a plot down below, one across the street, one you borrow, and there's a house that's going down. So those five, I have 7.1. But if you take the actual buildability, buildability color, and buildability means no ledge, slopes that we don't see a certain slope, um, things that are wetlands, setbacks, stuff like that. So we basically got a waiver for, for the site as well, saying at this point in time, it's working on the site. <coughs> the second means of egress. If we pursue this, uh, it is this present e uh, egress on site, can be waivered at this point in time. And if you revisit it, I'm sure Papa Ben is going to look at that waiver and stop working with you about let's try to fix that as well. <coughs> a waiver based on the situation you have right now. Does the board have any further questions? Do you have anything you want to add? No, I, 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 this is not uncommon. So, don't, don't feel terribly bad, but the next step is to try to re remedy all these deficiencies. This will be put up on um, the report that we're So we, you are going to accept the report tonight. Uh, from there, we'll continue to meet as a facility committee. And Is that 
um, a, as you just said, is that a recommended or is that a code requirement? It's an RSA is required by state statute. It's also repeated in the guidelines. Okay, so as, that one room is not meeting the recommended space? No, there's only one that does it. Okay. The other 12 do not meet the square foot requirement. <coughs> Okay, so it's a requirement, not a recommendation. None of this stuff has been recommendations. These are all factual data based on the Department of Ed guidelines, which is a written document, 2006. The state IRSA is our statutes. Okay, so if it comes from the Department of Education, does that mean if we don't follow their requirements, does that mean is that law is what I'm trying to get the at. Guidelines are there, but the but the uh, the, special, the, the uh, educational director will adhere to it as much as she can, Amy will. Mm -hmm. So if you do something, she's going to challenge you to correct those deficiencies. Right now, you're very because it, yeah. it's existing. But once you stop playing with it, the Department of Ed would, would step in and would like to see. Even though there's no funding, they will still need to react. Yeah, thank you so much for answering that question. You can thank her on the way out you can leave early, I think. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll have these boards we'll leave with you. And uh, everything's on the web, so these are on there as well as the report, which are two separate. And I'm going to suggest if you do leave early, there are other questions to think of. Would you mind answering any questions? No. Can we we'll just stick around a little bit? I think you can. I mean, well, we won't be time to talk about it. Thank you. Uh, moving on. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, one, one quick question. Is this electronically available? Is that what people are saying? Yeah, we just said that. Where? It's been up for three weeks. It's where? Two weeks. It, I was just corrected. I was asking if we were putting it up. Correct. And Russ corrected me and said it has been up for two weeks on our website. This, in, in, on our website. Yep. Everywhere. Thank you. Well, moving on. I forget where we are.
And we continue to, with cold weather, our buildings uh, are doing well, and credit for that. Uh, we have had uh, some freezing types in module classroom. We just spoke of that, uh, both in the uh, water coming in and the return. We've been able to rectify that quickly without any damage. Uh, we have a boiler at the middle high school that has been giving us a little trouble, but we have it up and running. Um, temperatures have been warm. Uh, people have been comfortable when we have been in school. Again, it's been a couple of tricky days there, but uh, safety being a priority to be able to go um, Just a, a quick aside, Sharon and Mary here, and, and last night Sharon uh, was recognized, the was recognized uh, for the Service Chamber of Commerce of the Person of the Year. Community uh, Member of the Year, so I just want to do that. And she had, she had the privilege of sitting next to the governor for dinner yesterday, so uh, we're very proud to have you on our podcast. Thank you very much, man. Uh, we have a PD day coming up on Tuesday. Um, thank you. Any questions from the board? Hearing none, I'll move to the next item on our agenda, and that would be strategic plan update administrative reports. So I'll, I'll just work quick because we had the conversation uh, Tuesday. Uh, folks, I think we'll have some more concrete examples to give you when we have our strategic report come February. Uh, right now we're still in committees, still meeting committees, still getting some things moving along. Um, and either administrator, if you'd like to jump in or anything, but I, what I have understood is that we'll give you a little more detail on February. Yeah. Well, our, we have a professional development day on Tuesday that Eppelman's buildings for spending this in the Next on our agenda is policy and the second reading of BEDA public participation at board meetings. And I have been a, a request for an open hearing to this division. I don't know how to handle this. So, so um, I'm going to pass the block to Mr. Sure. I have Mr. Banks actually uh, spoke to me yesterday on the phone, I believe. And uh, on that conversation, I contacted our attorney. Um, our training does not believe this time, given under the ED, ED 204, ED 201, um, that this would be a contested, um, a contested event, if you will, that the board would have the ability to have the hearing on. And because of the fact <coughs> that the Department of Education does not um, have the jurisdiction to oversee or regulate policy, it wouldn't defer to them based upon the findings here of the board. The, the attorney did say that obviously we have public comment and public input, and those would be the place or the appropriate place for those comments to be made to the board that they are heard. Okay. Is that a, excuse me, is that a, a denial of my request? Be because I have to proceed. So our attorney has said that we should. That he does not believe that that can be followed or hearing. Now, before we uh, move forward, I, I'd like to have the policy 